So I want to tell you a little bit about my neighbors. Now let me give a caveat, this is a small town. Not my current neighbors, this is years ago in a different neighborhood, so don't try to figure out who it is, okay? So one of my neighbors that we had was an older crabby lady. I mean, she really stayed inside of her house almost all the time, and we could tell she was a little eccentric, I think that's a nice word, um, but we had some decent interaction with her. But I found out later that when we were spray painting the house, the clouds, the, the steam that came out from that, uh, the mist that came out from that, she thought was a fire, so she called the fire department. But even funnier than that, when I was cleaning out the, uh, the chain link fence between our two yards, she called the police, I was later informed, and filed a complaint because I was stealing the dirt from her yard. And you just kind of roll your eyes and go, neighbors, right? Crazy neighbors? Well, we had some neighbors at a different time on the other side, and they were the loud, obnoxious neighbors. Do you ever had one of those? So they, they went to a, a church that doesn't teach the gospel. They were very opinionated, but mostly they were messy and loud. So they had like furniture in their front yard. They planted corn in their front yard. But the worst thing is that they yelled at their kids like every day. And they were so loud that when they yelled at their kids inside the house, you could hear it across the street. And when they yelled at their kids outside the house, you could hear it way down the block. It was so annoying. In fact, it was kind of guilt-producing because you thought, is this time to call CSD? Is this, is this abuse? And, you know, I have to tell you, we were civil to them. And, and then they, they moved and left their house in an absolute wreck. And we were so glad they were gone. I don't know if you've ever had neighbors that you wish they were gone or that you are glad they're gone. We had some other neighbors that really added to our life. We had some neighbors from Taiwan and taught us about some wonderful Chinese cooking. Uh, we had neighbors for quite a while from the Punjab state of India. And uh, wonderful friendship developed out of that, plus a lot of good chai tea. But one of our neighbors that I want to tell you a little more about was a young couple that moved in right across the street from us. And we'd known that somebody was moving in there, but we hadn't met him yet. And it was one of those wonderful Christmas Eves where you get snow, and we'd gone to church and had services, and we came home and we're bundling our little kids out of the car into the house, and, and all of a sudden, snowballs start zinging into our yard. And we found our new neighbors were starting a snowball fight. So we picked up and had a big snowball fight using other neighbors' yards, not messing our own up. And it kind of evolved into some hot chocolate and getting to meet each other. And, and over the course of the years we lived near each other, we had a wonderful relationship with those neighbors. And, and I am sure you can relate, if you've lived in any kind of neighborhood, that there's all kinds of different neighbors. And there is a, another topic in this, this discussion that we've talked about, spiritual healthy relationships. And we've talked about how God is supposed to have an impact in my life so that it affects how I treat the least of these, how I treat my spouse, how I treat my children. And now we're moving to the wider, broader perspective. And the word that we are using and that the scripture uses is, how does my love for Christ and his love for me, how does that make a difference in how I treat the neighbors? And neighbors is a pretty general word. In fact, the neighbor word comes from nigh, and meaning people who live nigh or close. So, you know, literally it means the houses and the few blocks around you, but in a larger sense it means the people that are near you, and maybe even we can stretch it to the people who are kind of like you. And so we have a, a great tendency to see neighbors as people like the last couple I was telling you about. They're fun, you connect with them, you have a social relationship, you have some things in common. And yet Jesus changes the word neighbor. Instead of being people that are easy to love and people that are like me, which I think probably are our preferred kind of neighbors, he tells a story that has a huge impact. And so in this story, he actually changed the word neighbor from loving people that are like you and near you and that maybe you have to love. And he changed the story. He changed the word by this story. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 10, or open your app and take notes as you follow along, or open the version. and we're going to read a story. I'm going to tell you a story that's probably very familiar to you, 
but I want you to hear it for the reasons it was being told, and I want you to let God speak to your heart through it. So Luke chapter 10 starts this story. Here's the setting. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Some versions call him a lawyer, but this means somebody who is well-versed in, in the Old Testament, particularly the first five books, which not only had relationships with God kind of organized and discussed, but how we're to treat our neighbors, how we're to run our cities. It was a comprehensive Jewish lifestyle book for the lawyers. And so he approaches Jesus and he says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he, re- he approaches him respectfully. He calls him rabbi or teacher. And then he asks a very loaded question. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And, and I think implicit in that idea of inherit eternal life means what, what's the bullet point list of things that I have to do so that I will be able to have eternity with God, to have a life with God after I die, to inherit, meaning kind of to earn the right to have it. And Jesus, who is a high proponent, you can see, of self-discovery, he didn't just answer him, he asks a question. He says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So he flips it back to him and says, well, you, you go first, you answer. And the lawyer said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And, second, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the remarkable part about this answer is it's almost exactly the same answer Jesus had given to this question earlier. Um, The the first part was pretty well known, I think, within Jewish culture, that Deuteronomy 6 is a passage called the Shema, where they would recite that daily, and it was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it was was understood that that was the the most important commandment of all, to to love God who made us and who designed a, a life that we can live. And so that's not surprising part of the answer. The second part was maybe a little more surprising. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And unlike the first commandment, love your neighbor as yourself comes from a, a passage in Deuteronomy. And if you read Deuteronomy 19, there's a whole bunch of laws about gleaning and about how to cut your hair and what not to do and who not to marry. And it's, it's kind of, if you will, in the minor section of the laws. And he picks it out of that section and says, no, your relationship with God is the most important. The second thing is to love your neighbor as yourself. And that was a startlingly, startlingly good answer. And so Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Gold star for you. Way to go. Do this and you will live. Ah, there's the rub. Because he said, that was a great intellectual answer. You answered the correct answer. But then he starts challenging him, is that how you live? Is that really who you are? Is that the essence of of what it means for you to have a relationship with God. And of course, he's pressing him because he knows the man's heart. And you see, it always comes back to heart because he said, do this and you will live. And then the next phrase, it says, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So here's the underlying problem. He's looking at that command, love your neighbor as yourself, And he's looking for the loophole. How many do I have to love? (laughs) Do I have to love the smelly ones and the ugly ones and the people who aren't like me and the foreigners? Or can I just love those that are like me and that are near me? And I think we often look at God's word with that kind of a mindset. What's the least I can do to get by? Instead of how is this going to fill me and change me and transform my life? And so Jesus looked at that man, and I think obviously he knew where he was coming from, and so he leads in with a story that is a huge impact uh, on on the Christian world, both uh, at that time and since then. And, And he tells him a story about a man who goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he, it says, he is attacked by robbers, he is beaten, his His things are taken, his clothes are taken, and he's left essentially on the roadside dying. Um, It's it's a stark scene. And so that's the setting. 
Then there are three people that walk by him. And the first, he says, is a Levite. And the Levite means he's from the tribe of Levi, and they were specifically set apart to, to be representatives of God and to help with the worship in the temple. They were, they were not the priests necessarily. They weren't all priests, but, but they were a holy people. And it says, the Levite walks by, he sees this man dying in the ditch, and it says he went to the other side of the road. You see, social distancing is not completely a new thing. He went to the other side of the road, and he passed on by. You think, well, why would he do that? Well, he was obeying the law. You see, the law said if you touch a dead body, or even if you touch blood from a body, then you are unclean, and then you can't worship in the temple, and that's their idea of holiness was that you protect yourself from all the unholy things around you, even the physical things. So he was technically obeying the law. And then it says the second guy comes by and he's a priest who would have even been a higher in the religious system. He was somebody who would help with the sacrifices, help with temple worship. And he did the same thing. He, he pulled off to the side and walked on by. And so I think he picks those two characters because they're very much like the person he's telling the story to. This guy that's an expert in the law would have identified with the Levite and the, and the priest. And so then he tells of a third person. And he says, and the third person comes along and he's a Samaritan. And I don't know how you respond when you are, experience a lot of, of somebody who has a great deal of prejudice, but the Jewish people had a tremendous prejudice against the Samaritans. They were people who had mixed the worship of God with the worship of idols, and they were considered just scum, and there was this long interaction of hatred, but the, the two groups together. And so when Jesus says the word Samaritan, I think probably the tension in the room just raised about 10 notches. And the third one was a Samaritan. And the lawyer's going, oh, great. And he says, what did the Samaritan do? And the Samaritan sees the man, same, same scenario as the first two. And he looks at him with compassion. And he gets off of his animal and he, and he goes down and he binds up his wounds and he comforts him. And then he goes to an extraordinary length. He, he picks him up and puts him on his own animal, to, his own donkey. And he, and he takes him down the road to Jericho and he, he finds a place for him to stay. And he pays out of his own pocket with, with at least enough for a couple of nights to stay. And then he, he tells that story and then he looks back at the lawyer. And he says, I have a question for you now. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? So he didn't say who was near him, who was like him. He kind of changes the whole meaning of neighbor. He says, which of these three chose to see this man as a neighbor? And, and the answer, the expert in the law says, the one who had mercy on him. <laughs> He gets the right answer because Jesus has backed him into a corner. But look at this. He doesn't even want to say the Samaritan. And isn't it ironic that the, the power that Jesus has, because up until that time, the word Samaritan would never have been coupled with the term good Samaritan. And now we think of this story as the good Samaritan. And there are hospitals all over the world that are called the good Samaritan hospital after this picture of compassion on somebody who had a need. And Jesus again says, go and do likewise. It's a very powerful paradigm shift where he says to him, you have the wrong picture of those two commands, of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which if we have that relationship with Christ should result in a life transformed, a transformation that makes us not only want to love our neighbors, but to have Christ's power in us and through us to be able to love our neighbors. And, and this is a huge shift for the thinking of the Jewish people at the time. In fact, they, they had a proverb, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, which, which kind of meant that, again, we care for those who are like us and, and close to us, but anybody else, we can be enemies with them. And Jesus said, no, that's not the picture of of being a neighbor at all. The picture is not who is your neighbor. The picture is how are you being a neighbor? Or, to make it a verb, how are you neighboring? And that's a much, much different question. I think it's powerful to realize this is not just one story in Jesus' life. This is not one time when he brings it out. In fact, I was thinking as you look through the stories of the New Testament that 
this picture of who is a neighbor and how do you see them as neighbors is something that Jesus actively lived all the time. He practiced what he preached. Not only does he tell the story of the Good Samaritan, and not only do the disciples watch it, but they record carefully. And, and I want you to notice as you read through the Gospels, as you, as you even look at some of the stories that are in the devotions for this week, I want you to think about how many times Jesus looks at people and he treats them in a completely different way than the culture around them. In fact, in your Emotionally Healthy Spirituality book, uh, Pastor Zach was telling me that this is a great line. It's on page 165. It says, Loving well is the goal of the Christian life. This is easier in our dreams than in practice. It requires that we grow into emotional adulthood in Christ, the rewards of which are rich beyond measure. How, how did Jesus love people? Well, you think about the people that he cared about. To the despised, the, the New Testament makes a real point of the fact that, that Jesus dealt with lepers who everybody else avoided. And he not only healed them, he touched them. That he dealt with tax collectors. In fact, he often makes the hero of some of his stories the tax collectors and the sinners. In fact, he even invited a tax collector to be one of his disciples. Something that no Jewish rabbi would have done because those were the outsiders. And to the wealthy, to, to people like Nicodemus who came asking questions, who, who had a great deal of power, to the rich young ruler, Jesus talks to him with compassion and care, but he doesn't, doesn't soft pedal the truth. In fact, he challenges both of them very specifically. And then to the people who are very educated, like the story that we're looking at, the, the ones who are teachers of the law, who are educated, he takes the very things that they know in their heads and he treats them respectfully and kindly, but he challenges them twice, Jesus said to this guy. Good answer. Go and do. Your life doesn't match up with the things that you're saying. And then I think that as we look at the foreigners, particularly, it is a, uh, a stark reminder that Jesus loved people that the rest of the Jewish population did not tend to love. And particularly, it it, it mentions several times when he dealt with Roman centurions. And, and these were people who had conquered them, who were taxing them, who were abusing them. And Jesus liked and dealt with Roman leaders, Roman centurions, like they were his neighbor. So this isn't some one-shot story that Jesus walks through and says, this is how you ought to be. This is, in fact, a lifestyle that he lived in the choosing of his disciples, in the way he healed people, everywhere he went. People who were outcast, marginalized, people who were unloved. Jesus neighbored them. So he's not only telling us this is what we should do, he's saying this is who I am, and I believe it follows that if Jesus is in us, then he is going to be working that out in our lives. So why is it so hard why is that simple command to love your neighbor as yourself, why is that so difficult? Well, I think it's more than difficult. I, I think it's impossible. And, and there's a powerful quote from John Piper. It says, it's overwhelming because it seems to demand that I tear the skin off of my body and wrap it around another person so that I feel that I am the other person. And all the longings that I have for my own safety and health and success and happiness I now feel for that other person as though he were me or as though she were me. I, I don't think we even feel that degree of natural love for our children. I think it's something supernatural. It's something that only God can work in us. But it's something that we need to desire and move toward. I'm going to share a little uh, a video about a, an important uh, and powerful principle about not only why this is so important, but what are the consequences if we don't learn to let Jesus love others through us? Let's watch this. So this is an important principle that I think helps underscore the fact that I cannot just live in my own limited ability to love, but that I have to learn to love people with the love of Christ. And so here's a picture that says, I, I'm at the center here. Here's my dot. And the first people that you're exposed to in your life are obviously your family and maybe immediate family and extended family. 
And usually there's somebody in your family circle that you just have a hard time with. Maybe you are opposite personalities, maybe you just like different things or something is set up. And if you don't work through that and learn how to deeply love that person, you create what I think of as a relational shadow. So there are people that you will meet with later down the road and they will remind you of this person. So this is your home and then say maybe this is school and I... I see these concentric circles. Maybe this could be your work situation or, or people who live in your neighborhood, but these concentric circles. And I was sharing this with a young man who was a teacher, and he talked about having a great difficulty with one of the people in his family and how they had never really resolved and they'd just kind of gone their own ways. And, and he said, you know, as you were telling me about this principle, I realized that there, there were two students that were in my class that I had already just kind of ignored and written off because they reminded me of my sister. And so we have these, these shadows that are affecting us. And, and maybe you have somebody at school and they're mean to you or, or they're from a different ethnic background or they're from a different uh, political party or somebody at your place of, of business who is just obnoxious in their views about some things. And, and all of those people that you do not learn how to genuinely love create this ever-growing relational shadow so that everybody who is in that category is not on your, I'm going to really love that person. And, and I think you see that with this rich young ruler, you, or excuse me, with the, the story that Jesus is telling to this expert in the law, is he had a category of people called Samaritans. And those people were off his Christmas card list. He did not care for them, didn't want to talk to them. And Jesus intentionally includes them because for every person that he had decided was not acceptable, not to be loved, this whole category of Samaritans, and Jesus intentionally picks the Samaritan in that story. But I, I want you to understand how vital it is to really learn to love the people that are in your closest circle, to really learn to love the people you're with regularly, whether it's school or work, to, to learn how to love people and Every time we find a difference between us, how we feel about masks, who we voted for for president, um, all the different ways in which we divide, every time we come to somebody that we cannot love, we have to say, Jesus, I need to learn to see them like you see them. I need to learn to love them like you love them. I need your power. Otherwise, you end up with all of these massive areas of people that I don't really love. And there's a very small group of people that I can actually love, and usually it's because they're like me. I think if you think through your own circles, you will find that to be very true, that we often discount people because of some label we have on their head, because of some person that we've been exposed to that's like them in the past, or, or a, a conflict that's unresolved. And, and I want us to move on now to talk about how did we actually make this happen? How, how does this happen in our lives? And and I put that into the question, how can I be Jesus to my neighbors? And what I mean is that this list that we've talked about, the alphabet of love, how do I accept them? How do I bear with them? How do I challenge them? How, how can I be devoted to those relationships? How can I be encouraging? How can I be forgiving? The, the alphabet of love, all these ways in which the Bible describes how we treat people, how do I get there? And, and I think actually this... This title may lead to a wrong conclusion. It may re lead to the conclusion that I just have to try harder to be more like Jesus. Jesus was a good example. I'm going to follow his example. So here we go. And that will fail miserably. Remember back to the first lesson in the series where we talked about that we have to be connected to the vine, that we're just branches, and that we have to be immersed in the life with Christ so it's not really me being Jesus to my neighbors. It's allowing Jesus to flow through me to him be Jesus to my neighbors. And I think it helps when we understand how we see ourselves. It's easy to make the gospel, the story about Jesus saving us, all about something that happened in the past instead of about something that's happening right now. And, and I think the good question that we like to ask is, in the story of the Good Samaritan, who are you most like? Who, who is the person that you most identify with? And as I've thought about it in the past, I've always thought about, 
well, I hope I'm not like the priest and I want to be more like the Good Samaritan. But as we were walking through this, I thought the shocking truth is, you know what I'm like? I'm like the guy that's on the roadside that was almost dead. And Jesus is the one that came and rescued me. He, the guy that was on the roadside dead could do nothing to save himself. And Jesus came and he's rescued me by coming and dying on the cross and by giving his life for me and by calling me to be adopted into his family. And so when I begin to see myself like that, then I, then I see other people who are also dying on the roadside more like that. I mean, if you play this story out of the, the Good Samaritan beyond what Jesus stopped the story, how do you think that guy who had been saved, who had been rescued by a Samaritan, how do you think he felt about Samaritans after that? Don't you think that changed his viewpoint? How do you think he felt about people who had been robbed and left on the roadside? I think he would have a great affinity, understanding that he was like them. And so, if I see myself in light of the fact that Jesus has rescued me from, from the wrath of God, from sure death, from destruction, from lostness, then, and only then, can I see other people differently. You see, I begin to see them through the eyes of how Jesus saw me. And you'll notice that most of these statements about how we are to treat people are based on accept one another as Jesus has accepted you. Forgive one another as you have been forgiven. Because what saves you is not rescuing people off the side of the road. What saves you is Jesus coming and rescuing us. But after he rescues us, it gives us a passion to want to be part of helping rescue others. So it changes how I see people because once you understand the good news of the gospel, all of a sudden those minor little differences that used to separate us, they should be nothing because we're all in the same category. We're all on a roadside dead. And Jesus rescues us and he is rescuing others. So what that does is that moves us from saying, I just need to be a nice neighbor. Because this idea of loving our neighbors as ourselves is, again, it's that high bar, impossible for us to do. And our tendency is either to want to pull it down and make it into just kind of try to be nice. I mean, even the neighbors that were loud and messy, we were civil with. We, we didn't say anything to them that was inappropriate or angry. We were nice. I, I don't feel like I loved them at all. So we tend to pull that down or we tend to leave it high and just feel guilty and condemned all the time. Or the third and the only good possibility is that we can say that's what God's called us to and I cannot do it, but Jesus in me can do it. And Jesus can begin to teach me and help me walk through the process of learning to love my neighbors like that. And Jesus wants me more than just to be a good, nice neighbor Jesus in me wants to reach them. He wants to rescue them because whether they're wealthy or educated or loud or smelly, their greatest need is Jesus. Their greatest need is not a neighbor that comes over and mows their lawn occasionally. Their greatest need is Jesus. And I can become a window through which Jesus shines. So how do I do that? What's my part in that? And I think this is really important to understand because it's easy for us to take too much or too little responsibility. So what's my part? He says that we are to commit ourselves to love them, which, which means what? It means that I'm praying for them, that I am a part of saying, God, teach me to love them, especially those difficult ones. Uh, may I suggest the second thing you do is listen. I think sometimes when Christians think about reaching their neighbors, it's all about, I've got to give you this certain amount of words about Jesus, and I, I've got to... St- Put it out there so at least you have the information. And I'll tell you what I've found is that listening first is a lot better way. To find out what their story is, to understand what their questions are, to, to even what Jesus did with the rich or with the with the young lawyer. He didn't just tell him, he asked him. He said, What do you think? And where are you coming from? And he led him in that way. And then hopefully there comes a time when you have a chance to honestly share your life and be unashamed of the gospel. When they say, this is what we did for the weekend, you can say, man, I went to church. We had an incredibly great time together with some other believers. And, you know, we're going through this family crisis, and I don't know what I would do without Jesus. 
And when they're going through a crisis, would it be all right if I prayed with you to unembarrassedly bring Jesus into your conversation? Let it, let it be a part of your life in even not a, a, a sort of I'm trying to sell this to you way. Just this is who I am and I, am, I have a, a life in Jesus and that's the most important thing about me. And You know, I think there's a lot of Christians that are nice neighbors, but they never want to talk about Jesus. And I hope that you can begin to get to that place where you can bridge that. And there may be some very specific things you can do to help. Um, we are actually going to try to help you take a step. In our, in our uh, life groups, we're having a serve week. And so there may be some practical way you can repair a fence or you can help take care of some yard work that needs to be done before the winter. Um, it may be a way of reaching out practically as a, as a group. Um, we're also trying to open up a way that you might be able to help financially. There's a lot of people going through difficult times with the COVID crisis and loss of hours and, and maybe uh, other things that are affecting their, their lifestyle. And we are hoping to o- help you help them. So either part of your serve project or what you just want to do as a family, if you know somebody who has some needs, we're going to give you an opportunity for a micro-grant. And what you need to do is go to familychurchweb.com slash grants, and it'll tell you about how you can come alongside a family that has some needs, and the church will help you with maybe some additional finances. You maybe come up with some of it, and we're going to add to that. And it would give you the power to be able to do more than you could have done before. But what it does is it puts you in connection with them in a way that says, I care about you. And I love you. And in fact, if they want to, to find out, you can even say, and this, some of this came from our church. We would like to help you. And that's one of the incredible ways to give them a picture of Jesus. Then there's God's part. We can love people. We can listen to them. We can share with them. But we cannot draw anybody to Jesus. God has to do that. God draws them. And, and so there's that part where he begins to work and draw and call them. And, and he has a lot more tools in his belt than we do, and he can do it all kinds of different ways. And then there's their part. They have to come to a place where they choose to believe and decide to follow Jesus. And and if that happens, we get to be a a wonderful part of that process. In fact, I'll tell you, that couple across the street that we met because they threw snowballs at us, never quite forgiven them for that, but we had a great time. We developed a friendship over the years, and that young couple didn't have any kids, and they were just a little ways past their wedding date, and that was Craig and Jennifer Hall, and we had a wonderful time watching their boys grow up, and they were a part of our girls' lives, and through that, actually one of our other neighbors invited them to church, and they began to seek after Jesus, and they chose to follow him, and and if you fast forward that uh, about 20 years... That is Pastor Craig and his wife, Jennifer. And God has worked in them in such an incredible, amazing way to bring them to a place where now he's training other people to help make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And I tell you, it had very little to do with us, and it had a lot to do with God, and it had a lot to do with the choices that they've made. But I tell you, there's hardly any more exciting story that I could tell you of how God has used the neighbors and the people that we were neighbors with to do something far beyond what we would ever ask or dream. And you know what I would hope for you? I would hope that God would give you a love for the neighbors that are like you and the neighbors that are not like you. And that out of that, some will reject, some may reject you, some may reject Jesus. But what if some of them came to know Jesus and started growing and started really following Jesus? And you think of the trajectory of Craig and Jen's life from where we met him over 20 years ago and how they've raised their kids to follow Jesus, and how they've had an impact on so many other lives. And let me tell you, it is well worth it. I'm going to hand off to the campuses, and the campus pastors are going to lead you in a final discussion, final thought, and Jason's going to talk to those of you who are online or from South County. Thanks for listening.